Today in our lineup on the now, new DNA technology is helping to crack a growing number of cold cases. How it's providing breakthroughs in cases authorities once thought might be unsolvable. A lack of affordable low-income housing is impacting all of us. We're getting perspective on what it's going to take to get more people help. And apps can be a great way to help manage your money, but some may be too good to be true. What you need to watch for so that you don't get hit with extra fees. Thanks, Annie. I'm Amanda Starantino, and you're watching the Now Indeed. The 2020 legislative session is over in less than a week, perhaps as early as tomorrow. And the state's biggest teachers union is looking back at the wins and losses over the last few months. The Indiana State Teachers Association celebrated some actions state lawmakers took, such as holding teachers and schools harmless from iLearn test, test scores. But teacher pay remains the biggest hurdle for ISTA. The group called on lawmakers to invest $75 million into teacher pay this session. But that won't happen. Governor Holcomb and state lawmakers are waiting until next year for a serious push to teacher pay. The governor has asked that uh, we get Indiana into the top three for teacher pay in the region. We believe by failing to do anything this session that we've actually put the state further behind. The legislative session is set to end tomorrow evening, but could extend a few more days if their work is not done. Grant County prosecutors have filed a theft charge against a former administrative assistant to the Grant County commissioners. Tamaria Miller is charged with one count of felony theft. Prosecutors say she made nearly $3,000 in personal credit card purchases on the taxpayer dime, including gasoline, cell phone service, utilities, and other purchases. Her trial is scheduled for June. We have been unable to get in touch with Miller or her attorney. Kevin, cloudy skies, kind of like what we saw all day. Yes, we'll get to some sunshine, but we'll have to be patient, won't we? Lots of clouds in central Indiana. No rain, though. We've turned the corner from the rain that we had this morning. In some cases, anywhere from quarter to three quarters of an inch. The gray is with us again during the day tomorrow. Temperatures are falling. I'm sure you've noticed that. Coldest to the northwest, still a little warmer to the south and east. Six degrees warmer in Columbus than it is right now in Lafayette. That wind out of the northwest, also a drier air moving in, drier wind, so that will push uh, at least the uh, drizzle that we've had through part, portions of the afternoon out of the state. Temperatures making their move to the 30s eventually overnight tonight, but still low 40s at 11 o'clock tonight. Delta and American Airlines are both cutting flights as people cut back on flying due to the coronavirus. Delta says it's cutting capacity for flights in the U.S. by 15 percent and internationally by 20 to 25 percent. American is reducing capacity for flights in the U.S. around 7 percent in April and by 10 percent internationally for the summer. Airlines have been enhancing their cleaning processes for planes. And to prevent coronavirus spread, we keep hearing about protective measures like hand washing, cough etiquette, and limit face touching. But that's a lot easier said than done. It's super simple but difficult to implement. And I want to acknowledge that it's tough for me too to not touch my eyes, nose, and mouth. That's the Santa Clara County Public Health Department director talking about her own accidental face touching during a coronavirus press conference a few days ago. She licked her fingers flipping through her notes. So why is it so hard? Psychiatrist Carol Lieberman says it goes back to when we were babies and feelings of satisfaction. One of the reasons why we keep touching our mouth is because, especially the more anxious we get, is because um, the mouth is the center of oral gratification. It's just like why people smoke cigarettes or eat too much food. The more stress, the more likely we're to touch our faces. And speaking of stress, Dr. Lieberman says people are worrying about the virus to the point that they're developing what she now calls coronavirus stress syndrome. There are 10 symptoms, and if you have three, you might be suffering from it. It is getting to uh, very dangerous proportions, a lot more dangerous in regard to um, stress, the psychological aspect of it, and people doing things in a panic, mass hysteria, and doing things that are more dangerous um, than the actual coronavirus. That level of stress can weaken your immune system and ultimately make you more likely to get sick. Dr. Lieberman says if you're getting to that state, practice stress relievers. Avoid fear-mongering people or news sources. Work on strengthening your bond with family and friends. And plan reasonably for the virus, like if you need to work from home.
All right, back to our lineup. You would think as companies learn more about us that they can better tailor products and prices. But ahead, how computer tools can actually be leaving us paying more for things we're required to have, like car insurance. We've seen and heard about the run on hand sanitizer, wipes, and disinfectant at stores around the country and here in Indiana. So if you walk into a store and discover they just put out 10 bottles of sanitizer or containers of wipes, what should you do? Consumer reporter John Mattery shows why pharmacists are begging you to think of others so you don't waste your money. First, it was face masks that disappeared after a run on stores by nervous consumers. Well, now it's hand sanitizer and wipes. And pharmacists are now begging people to please stop hoarding. Tanisha Stewart was heading into Walgreens to grab a couple of supplies to keep her family safe. Clorox wipes and Lysol. Mm -hmm. That's about it. Good idea. But pharmacists are sounding an alarm because other people are buying too many supplies. The phones keep ringing. We're still having people call about face masks. We're having people come in asking for masks. And then we've actually started having people come in wanting um, any hand sanitizer or disinfecting wipes that we have. Pharmacist Troy Stinson says they ran out of masks weeks ago, but now hand sanitizer is running low. We couldn't find a single bottle of Purell left in this Walgreens store in Oakley. Pharmacists say, sure, it's a good idea for everybody to have a bottle of hand sanitizer in their home right now. But they say if you walk into a store and you see just three or four bottles of it left, think of other people and don't buy it all up. Completely unnecessary to buy them all. Those, If you want to have one on hand, that's a good idea to have, but it's not necessary to buy all of them. But that's what we're seeing at some supermarkets, Sam's Clubs, and Costco's. A Walmart spokesman tells us they are resupplying, saying we're working with suppliers to understand and mitigate any supply chain disruptions. Providing customers with the products they need remains our focus. But it's a lot tougher when people are hoarding. A few bottles of sanitizer is great. Stashing enough for a small army is selfish. So think of others and don't waste your money. Working for you, I'm John Matteries for RTV6. One of the most expensive aspects of owning a car is insurance. And now advances in data and technology could leave drivers paying unfair premiums. A new nonprofit newsroom, The Markup, is uncovering how complicated computer programs are impacting our lives. They teamed up with Consumer Reports to look into all states' car insurance retention algorithm. It was rejected in Maryland in 2014. The data revealed some drivers that should have gotten hundreds in discounts only had a very small drop in rates and premiums significantly increased for people who were already paying the most. If there was someone who was uh, supposed to get an increase in their insurance rates and they were already paying a lot, those rates would go up as high as 20%. But if they were paying less, their rates would only go up um, about 5%. All state responded, saying in part they are in compliance with state laws. But Markup found that similar retention models were proposed and rejected in Louisiana and Georgia. And 10 states have some sort of all state retention models in place. We don't know exactly how those retention models work in those states because just we didn't have the same level of access to data. And also when we asked Allstate, they were not forthcoming with details of how their uh, systems work precisely. The Consumer Federation of America has been making noise about retention insurance practices for some time. California has a class action lawsuit against farmers for charging long-standing customers more. The larger problem is that more detailed data is available about us. Plans presented by insurance companies are getting far more complex and harder for regu regulators to understand. But efforts are underway to develop best practices, like what questions and data to ask insurance companies for. Meanwhile, it's up to us to make sure that we're getting the best deal by shopping around. Well, ahead in our lineup, new DNA technology is helping to crack a growing number of cold cases. It's given life, new life to cases that um, we, we once thought might have been unsolvable. How this technology is changing the methods for investigators. File.com or call the number on your screen. Technology is changing the way law enforcement does its job. Elizabeth Ruiz found out it's helping police solve more cold cases. 
It was January of 1980 when 21-year-old Helene Prusinski was kidnapped, raped, and murdered in Douglas County, Colorado. Her body was found in a field, but police never identified a suspect. Prusinski's murder became a cold case. We consider a case that does not have any viable leads after one to two years, a cold case. However, cold case detective Shannon Jensen says the case was never forgotten. Detectives continued to reopen it for 40 years. Then with the help of new DNA technology, the suspect was identified in December of last year as James Curtis Clanton. He will be sentenced on April 10th based on the first degree murder laws in 1980. Krusinski's sister, the only immediate family still living, finally received the closure she had waited decades for. She couldn't believe that after all these years, we, we were able to identify and arrest a suspect in her sister's murder. One key element to solving the case was DNA from people related to Clanton. Detective Jensen actively searched a public database called GEDmatch, which is used as a way for people to learn more about their family history. She came across Rob Deal, who turned out to be Clanton's fourth cousin. When Detective Jensen reached out, he says he went through a wide range of emotions. You know, a split second, you go, Okay, I'm good. <laughs> and then I think about my relative, my cousins who lived in the Denver area in the 1980s and thinking, oh, what if they're implicated? But Rob says it didn't take long for him to realize he wanted to help, especially when he discovered how serious the crime was. You just think it's been cold for decades and so long that if there's no evidence now, this isn't going to be solved. So Rob gave Detective Jensen access to his family tree and his DNA. Those both are critical elements in a newly utilized DNA technology called genetic genealogy. Traditional genealogy is using public records to document a person's family tree and their ancestors. Genetic genealogy is when you're using DNA to help with that process. Cece Moore is the chief genetic genealogist at Parabon Nanolabs. Parabon didn't work on Ms. Brzezinski's case, but the tech company has has helped law enforcement across the nation identify more than 100 criminals the past two years. For us, significant amounts of DNA could be less than 1%, which is really a breakthrough because previously with law enforcement cases, you needed to have an exact match or a very close family member. In Prusinski's case, law enforcement in 1980 collected plenty of DNA evidence and stored it properly, making it possible for detectives today to upload a DNA profile to find her killer. In fact, in fact, Detective Jensen says she's currently in the process of solving two more cold cases. It's given life, new life to cases that um, we, we once thought might have been unsolvable. In Douglas County, Colorado, I'm Elizabeth Ruiz reporting. Elizabeth, thank you. A new report released today shows significant gaps in affordable housing for the most vulnerable. The National Low Income Housing Coalition found a shortage of 7 million homes nationwide for the lowest earners. That's only about 36 affordable rental properties for every 100 needed. We're talking about people living below the poverty line, seniors, those with disabilities, families with young children, and others. The group says solutions are there, but underfunded. Inaction is expensive, like we're, we're actually paying, as a country, we're paying to, to allow people to remain homeless. A lack of affordable housing costs taxpayers in other ways, through increased health care costs, lower education levels, people earning less over a lifetime and paying less in taxes. Increased funding and proven solutions can close the gap, like the National Housing Trust Fund, rental assistance, public housing, and cash assistance programs to help people facing unexpected financial emergencies and eviction. So if we were to instead invest in the solutions, we would not only have people benefiting from being affordably housed, but we would actually uh, find savings throughout the federal government. This is a problem in every community. We've gone from a wet morning to a dry evening. The clouds have stayed with us all day long, and the wind that's been gusting to 20 miles per hour calms down tonight. The rain chance low tomorrow, most of Thursday. It's really Thursday night that the rain chance climbs once again, and our mildest temperatures, at least in the short term, will come on Thursday. Temperatures fall back a bit over the weekend. Here's where we stand now. Kokomo's at 39. That kind of sticks out as a cool spot compared to Indy and Bloomington.
We all have this west northwest wind, a cooler wind that's going to drive the temperatures down into the 30s for all of us tonight. Temperatures just slowly falling with the cloud cover staying in place. That keeps us from really starting to drop off. Otherwise, temperatures would fall quite a bit more. 36 tomorrow morning in Peru. Temperature in Lafayette at about 37. A chance for any sprinkles or showers would be in the northern third of the state. Otherwise, cloudy cool as we go through the day tomorrow. Wind won't be too strong out of the southwest 5 to 10. 50 by noon, 56 or 57 for the afternoon high temperature with skies mostly cloudy. We talk about the changes as we move toward Thursday. The rain chance will increase late in the day. The temperature jumps as well into the low 60s. The rain chances start as we get into the late afternoon evening hours, then they become likely that we'll see the rain as we get to Thursday night. But here are other high temperatures, warmest day of the work week. We'll talk about the four day forecast coming up. The coronavirus epidemic is having major impact on small Asian run businesses here in the U.S. Thomas Hoppe found some places say customers have dropped by half. <laughs> The Pacific Ocean market has been a staple of Asian American businesses in Aurora, Colorado for years. My name is Betty Lamb. Um, I am the owner's daughter, one of the two daughters of the Pacific Ocean Marketplace here. There's such a variety of places to eat, the different types of food, and uh, things that we, you don't normally see in uh, the ordinary market. Within the last month, business has been somewhat of a roller coaster ride since the coronavirus first surfaced. With people panicking across the country, um, we've heard stories in New York saying that there's no more rice. And in Atlanta, there's no more rice. So people are continually to stock up on that. The outbreak began in China and quickly spread across Asia. Since then, a growing number of coronavirus cases have been confirmed in the U.S. And customers seem to be staying away from Asian American businesses as a precaution. According to the New York Times, business at shops that sell Asian products dropped by 70% in the first two weeks of February. The Chinese Merchants Association in San Francisco says foot traffic in their Chinatown district dropped by 50%. It's a little off and on right now. We're not too sure how it's going to go. I think it's kind of sad. I think we're panicking for no reason at all. Uh, that doesn't keep me from going out. From the restaurants we work with, um, we, we have seen and heard that they're not doing very good and that there have been a lot of customers that just, even loyal customers that haven't been going to their restaurants um, due to the coronavirus. That he hopes that the public continues to be educated and aware. That way Asian businesses can still thrive during these times. I'm Thomas Hoppel reporting. Thomas, thank you. A bill to help enforce protections for kids online will go before a committee tomorrow. Basically, it would allow tech companies to be exempt from lawsuits if they have the required protections for children in place. Critics say the legislation could have a negative impact if companies aren't responsible for content on their platforms. Well, next in the lineup, apps can be a great way to help manage your money, but we have what you need to watch for so that you don't get hit with extra fees.